It's Friday again, and welcome to the 64th edition of the Zogby Report, real and unscripted. This is when, as everybody knows who listens and watches, my son Jeremy and I uh, shoot the breeze, pick a couple of issues of the day and talk about them um, with each other, respectfully, always, and um, uh, take at times different uh, points of view, but mainly like to show that we can take different points of view and still emerge uh, friends and father and son and and always respectful. How are you doing this week? I'm doing pretty well. I like that number 64. What do you think about that? Yeah, will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 64? Okay, I'm past that. So will you still need me and will you still feed me when I'm 74? Of course, and, and I have to ask the same thing to my son. I just want to add to, to you know, the the wonderful thing about the show, in addition to what you said, is that you never know what you're going to get, right? No. We no. don't, and uh, our listeners don't. No. So I think this one is maybe kind of obvious this week. It came to mind. And I think we we should talk about Derek Chauvin and uh, Dwayne Wright um, in uh, Minneapolis, the suburbs of Minneapolis. The, the trial is pretty much wound down and the jury will uh, get their instructions. And then uh, a new justice process begins in the case of Kim Potter, the 26 uh, the year police veteran who shot Mr. Wright. But let, let's first of all talk about the trial uh, that is winding down uh, and then talk about the using a taser or, or using a, a, a full grade weapon as opposed to a taser and the implications of that. And then let's talk about race and the, the broader issue. So you're following the trial, of course, I know that. Um, what, what do you think is going on here? And then I'll give you my thoughts. Well, why don't you start? Because I, I am following it, but not, not as extensively as I should be. Okay, so I, uh, I am a devotee of the United States Constitution, and I believe that all Americans are protected under those rights, uh, sometimes very controversially. So former Officer Chauvin uh, is entitled to his day in court. I think it's been a very difficult defense to prepare, and uh, you know his 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 attorneys have uh, been there for him. Uh, I think correctly they decided that given a volatile personality that he has and the the potential for uh, devastating cross examination by the prosecution, wise to not put him on the on the stand. But I think, frankly, uh, some elements of the defense um, have been embarrassing. Uh, I think that's mainly because there really is no case. Um, the, the, we watched what killed uh, George Floyd to bring up towards the end of the trial the possibility that it could have been exhaust or the possibility that it could have been drugs in his system. All that weighed against not only the myriad of witnesses, including professional law enforcement and professional uh, path pathologists and so on, but always, always the videotape uh, played over and over again, uh, nine minutes and 29 seconds of literally snuffing out a fellow human being. Um, Here's what I think is going to happen. He will be found guilty. I, I believe he will be found guilty on all four charges from murder to involuntary manslaughter. Um, I, I don't see the possibility of even a juror holding out on this, but I also don't think that the jury will be back in an hour. I think as these things go, they will get back to the jury room. 
they will do their poll where all 12 agree that he is guilty, at least on most of the charges initially. And then I think from there, they will have lunch, um, talk to each other, play some games, drag it out. So it just doesn't look like uh, after several weeks of, of trial and testimony that, uh, uh, that, that they were haphazard about this. And then I, I believe sometime midweek, uh, they'll come back with their verdict. Uh, and the verdict, as I indicated, will be guilty on all charges. I know I shouldn't speculate, but hey, I own half of this show, so I'm speculating and uh, on the basis of what I've learned. And as you know, because you've worked with me, uh, I've, I have done a lot of jury uh, uh, selection and jury, uh, um, jury uh, surveys over the years. You have a different take on it? Um, well, first I would say that your your forecasting abilities are even beyond elections. So you could you probably are right. You know me that that I take all sides before I yeah. come to a decision. And in the immediacy of of the death of George Floyd, I would say the the for several months. I had a sense towards Derek Chauvin, and and sorry if this is, if this is brute, but I thought he gets what he deserves. In other words, if a mob shows up at his house and they burn it down, he gets what he deserves. I, I'm not proud of that, saying that and feeling that because that's not civilized. But the brutality of of that footage and and of his act was disgusting, and I think that. Most people, anybody with a heart, which I think are the vast majority of the public who saw that, probably had difficulty sleeping that night, including myself. Um, but as time has gone on, I, I've found some interesting tidbits. The first thing that I learned was that, and, and unless this has been overturned, but apparently George Floyd and Derek Chauvin worked at the same nightclub. So they may have known each other. Now they may, they necessarily didn't work the same shift, but I find it hard to believe that given that, and, and of course the, the owner of that nightclub confirmed that. What I, was de what I was really shocked by was how that was not being reported in the news. I mean, if I were a reporter, that would be like, that would make the second paragraph, maybe, there could have been some bad blood between the two. I don't know. Maybe it could have been personal or may maybe they didn't know each other, but I think that was something that should have been reported. I'm not going to say front and center, but at least second or third paragraph. That's, that's, that's pretty important. We know Chauvin has a record. I believe there have been over a dozen instances of reports on him. So he's a bad dude. He's abused his power and he should be prosecuted. The question is to what extent? I don't believe there was murder with intent. I, 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 don't, I don't believe that. And here's the other thing. I, I'm not a medical doctor, but according, there, there are these autopsies that have been done that, I, I mean, un, unless this is all made up, I mean, I, I actually looked at um, the, the autopsy report from the county doctor and and it said that that floyd had fentanyl in his system a high amount and so i think the defense runs with that saying that you can't prove that that necessarily uh uh you know whether whether it was the knee or whether it was heart failure because a, a month prior to the incident he did have a heart attack from fentanyl use so I, look this isn't to be contrarian this is, we want to make sure that, that justice is, is used not with a mob mentality like I had in the immediacy of, the, of seeing the footage where I thought, look, if the mob attacks Derek, he deserves it. I, I don't think we, we should let that seep into our justice system because that's medieval. And, and we don't want to be like a medieval uh, uh, trial uh, based society. I mean, read the, f the famous short story. I think it was by, oh, I, I can't remember his name, but it's called The Lady or the Tiger. Basically an arbitrary system of determining whether you get 
punished or not. So look, make no mistake about it. We know Derek Chauvin has had instances, several instances of using force and, and brutality, but did he mur did, is it manslaughter or is it the next level? I, I don't know that it's murder with intent. And, um, and that's about all I can say on, on that aspect. I, I, I do think I raised some fair questions. You do, and let me, let, let me just try to deal with a few of them. Um, while the, the probability uh, that they knew each other and had worked different shifts at a, a club or a bar uh, has been out there, uh, I don't know that it's relevant to the degree that, that, that is, it's a lead, that it's a headline. Did you know that they knew, that they knew each other? Yeah. I, um, but the fact that we know that indicates that it's been reported and to what degree could, is, is that relevant if they had bad blood between them? Uh, I don't know. The murder with intent thing is troubling. Now, let's just parse this for a second. I, I think I'm correct in saying we all went into this trial with the notion of eight minutes and 47 seconds. You'll remember there was graffiti, there were t-shirts, there were signs. That's a very, very long time, uh, eight minutes and 47 seconds to develop intent uh, to, to murder, even if you haven't planned, even when you handcuff even when Mr. Floyd resisted, eight minutes and 47 seconds, especially in a prone position, is a very long time. But then we learn as the trial begins that it's actually nine minutes and 27 seconds. Now let's stop and think of that for a moment. I did not have intent this is hard to believe. I did not have intent to snuff this guy out for eight minutes and 47 seconds, but it is clear those last 30 seconds, probably more, but those last 30 seconds that this guy is not a threat, is, is not breathing, is incapacitated, and it went on for an additional 30 seconds, 30 two seconds, uh, it is hard to believe that there is not intent to kill at that point. So I'm not a lawyer, but um, I don't think to prove intent, I don't think it means I woke up in the morning and I said, I've got to find George Floyd and I'm going to kill him. That's clearly intent. But if I have time to think about it, if this is clearly not a spontaneous action, if this is clearly not a momentary lapse on the part of Derek Chauvin, uh, where there's a point of no return, or he lost it and did something uh, that was against what he wanted to do, that's where I think you know you the manslaughter, uh, involuntary uh, homicide, where that kicks in, but. Uh, I, it's very hard to make the case that there wasn't intent during the, those uh, nine minutes and however many seconds. Well, I, I you know, I, I mean, look, I only brought up the, the, the possibility, and I think I made this clear that in the early part of the reporting, that that wasn't really being talked about. We 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 were just we were just focused on it, what what appeared to be two random people. But I'm just saying that if I were a journalist and, you know, within a few days, within a couple of days that came out, I, I would I would want to report that because mm -hmm. otherwise, if you look at the video, it just looks like it was it was a random thing. And so while you have riots that are blowing out of proportion and a city burning, you might want to quell that. Right. You don't want to you know, this is the problem when when journalism doesn't do its 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 due diligence and 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 full job. They have they the, you run the risk of riots and riots continuing on for days, if not weeks, and then spreading throughout the country. So 
the, the only that's that's the whole point of, of why I'm saying that it, in in the beginning of the story that would have been important to to report right away and it wasn't being reported for a while I, and, and I'm not going to say that was for sinister reasons I'm just going to say that I think that 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 possible fact or that fact should have should have been mentioned and now look I can't talk about intent I can't talk about the the medical um autopsy I read it um I I, I don't know I mean e either you think that that the the doctor is a quack or or you think that maybe he has you know an affinity for Chauvin I I have no idea I, truthfully what I think more important is the the wider implications of this and society. And I think that's probably where you're going with this, where, where we could shift the conversation away, away from this obviously very important story, but what does it mean for the nation and what does it mean a, as a society? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I did want to talk about Dwayne Wright. I don't know what there is to talk about. Uh, a 26 year police veteran mistaking uh, her handgun for uh, uh, for a taser uh, is pretty hard to believe, um, but she's in trouble, and there's uh, no question about that. Uh, you know, <clears throat> a bill has <clears throat> made its way through the Judiciary Committee uh, in the House of Representatives, uh, and not the Senate yet, but requiring President Biden to form uh, a committee to look into various options uh, for reparations for Black Americans. Um, I, I don't know what the commission will come up with, but I, th I think it's time has come. I think we are beyond that stage. Um, we, uh, we have laid bare the open sores <clears throat> of racism to the point of the, some long buried overt racism is now in the forefront. It's not only the police, it's institutional, it's systemic, uh, even more than I thought it's in the hearts and minds of Americans, white Americans. And, and at the same time, I also think that without reparations, we, will permanently hold back too many uh, people of color who just simply will continue to be lost or victimized uh, by the system, if not by their own neighbors. And so I, th I think it's time to have that conversation. And if it means spending some money to spend that money. Uh, and so no conclusion yet. Um, there are some ideas that are out there that uh, could possibly be feasible in terms of reparations, but I think we are at the point to have that conversation and, and have it now. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, you know, one of the, one of the unique aspects of, of, of my line of reasoning or, or of my reasoning is that I don't believe in either or. So it's kind of like the yin and the yang. They're, they're not opposite. They're actually complementary. So what I mean by that is, while I believe that there's racism, racism in the society, right? I don't see it as, well, you either think there's racism or there, or there isn't. I do think that there's racism. Fact number one, if, if you are an African-American, you are more likely to, to die at the hands of, of police. Right. But at the same time, I know from statistics that actually more white people die every year uh, than black people at the hands of the police. So fact one is two to one more white people die in terms of frequency. This is this is from the FBI statistics going back to 2017, 18, 19 and 20 year after year, about two to one more white people die at the hands of, of police than black people. But at the same time, Black people, are, it, it, it affects them disproportionately. So the disproportionately aspect is the, 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 I do think racism plays that part of it. But if we only look at racism, then we're missing about, well, what about the, the two times more white people that die at the hands of police? And so it's not just 
an issue of racism. It's a, an issue of police brutality. And I think that we're doing a, a, a disservice and an injustice to America by only looking at the racial aspect of it. Yes, it's true, and we should focus on it. But that doesn't mean that we should overlook the fact that, like I keep saying, twice as, more, as many white people die. And, and what's fascinating to me is, I know that, but I can't even name you one white person that's died at the hands of the police, even though it happens two times more in, in terms of frequency. So to me, the, the media in this, in this story should be focusing at the same time, and it's not contradictory, at the, the race and racism angle and the, the overall blanket, our overarching theme of police brutality towards Hispanics, towards white people, and towards African Americans. And that's what binds us all together because it's an important issue that, that affects our communities uh, across the nation. So the question is, is what do we do about it? I don't think that defunding the police is the way to go because if you live in the inner city and, and <coughs> I mean, what's going to replace it if you're a law-abiding citizen and you feel threatened? I know that there's already, already this problem that if you call the police, well, they'll show up 30 minutes late. I think, now, in, in a previous podcast, I said something about privatizing the police. I've now moved away from that position. I, I do think there should be private security forces as services available to neighborhoods, but I don't think it should necessarily replace the police. I think that there should be a reward and punishment system for police officers in forces across the country, where if you don't do your job, you're kind of like kind of like a salesperson, right? They get an incentive to to make a commission, um, and then if they don't, if they don't do their job, they get fired. I think we should have the ability to ding police officers who don't act in the best interest of the public. Why? Because they're public servants, because they're funded by taxpayers. Taxpayers should have that ability to say, or, or to pressure the police forces, you're gone if you're not doing your job. You, you get you know, your pension uh, defunded, not entirely, but dinged. Uh, you get your sick, you don't get a raise. You get your salary lower if you do or don't do these certain acts. Whoever came up with the term defund the police handed those who don't want any police reform a tremendous gift because uh, it's very hard to explain. Um, it doesn't get at what the core of the problem is. It's dangerous and it doesn't have any appeal whatsoever to the middle ground of voters and community residents. And we've done some work over the years, we've done some work together, even uh, locally here on attitudes towards uh, local police. And, um, you know, it is blacks and, and Latinos who want a strong police presence because they're on the firing line. They don't want to defund the police. They want the police to act more responsively and, and better. So the defund the police movement was, um, Progressives talking to progressives and forgetting about the fact that there are other folks around. Um, and it throws the agenda all, all off. I think we're having a conversation about police reform. Seem to be having it all over in large cities, small cities. I think it's a, a very huge problem and issue. It, it's training, but goes beyond training. It's sensitivity and awareness and community, better community links. It's better use of crisis intervention. Um, those police forces, Dallas uh, and Fort Worth are two that I know of that actually have triage teams that go out to respond on calls that in include a law enforcement official, a medical official, and a mental health official. Evaluate the situation, obviously, in a in nanoseconds and then determine who takes the lead. And who takes the lead can really alter the course of how the intervention is. If it's the cop with the gun or the medical official to treat something medically or the quieter, calmer, experienced voice 
of mental health. That's going to require a commitment, but check out Dallas and Fort Worth. I forget the name of the program, but I do see it spreading um, uh, throughout the United States and still very new. I have a lot of hope for that. Don't lead with the gun. Don't lead with the gun all the time. Yeah. Well, I think we had a good conversation. Um, at this point in time, next week, are we going to be um, just reporting that Derek Chauvin has been found guilty, that he's been found not guilty, or the jury is still deliberating? What do you think? I, I don't know. I, I really don't know. I'm going to go out on a limb and uh, he will be found guilty uh, by this point in time. Okay, if the question is, will he, will, will he, I guess I was more or less thinking, what will the aftermath be? Um, no, I, I think it's, I think it's likely that he's going to be found guilty. Okay, let's leave it at that. See you. I'll see you beforehand, but uh, we'll see everybody at number 65. And before we sign off, we want to hear from you, right? And we want you to, so many people tell us, hey, we like this. Please share it. Yeah, please notify your your friends. Please write to us that you like it. Tell us what, what we're missing. And um, we want to answer your questions too. So long. We'll talk next week. Take it easy. Have a great weekend.